Welcome to our second video about the proximal convoluted tibial. Today we're going to discuss the pathology. So before we start, I highly recommend watching the first video that I discussed the physiology of the proximal convoluted tibial. So after watching that video, now you're ready, now let's get started. Renal cell carcinoma is the most common type of kidney cancer in adults. It arises from the cells lining the proximal convoluted tubule, and that's why I mentioned it here. Hardnap disease is an autosomal recessive disease that causes malabsorption of the nonpolar amino acids. This is by the proximal convoluted tubules and the intestinal cells. This disease is caused by a genetic defect in the sodium amino acid co-transporter or symporter that's present in the brush border of the proximal convoluted tubule cells. This transporter is deficient in this disease. And this transporter is present in both the proximal convoluted tubule cells and the intestinal cells as well. And this will lead to the malabsorption of amino acids, most specifically the nonpolar amino acids. The most important of all these nonpolar amino acids is tryptophan, because tryptophan is the precursor amino acid in the formation of three important substances by the body. The first one is serotonin, which is a big neurotransmitter in the brain. The second is melatonin, which is another neurotransmitter in the brain, which is important for the wakefulness. And also the niacin, or the NAD, nicotinamide dinucleotide. Niacin deficiency, most specifically, leads to a disorder called pellagra. This pellagra is famous for what's called the three Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. So bottom line, Hartnap disease is a disease that affects the proximal convoluted tubule cells and the intestinal cells. And this will lead to the deficiency of nonpolar amino acids, most importantly the tryptophan. The deficiency of tryptophan will lead to the deficiency of niacin, which is B3, serotonin, and melatonin. And the deficiency of niacin will lead to the 3Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. The next disorder is called Fanconi syndrome. This is a generalized dysfunction of the proximal convoluted tubule. So unlike Hartnup disease, this is not a specific transporter deficiency. This is a generalized deficiency or a generalized dysfunction of the entire proximal convoluted tubule transporters. This disorder can be congenital or acquired. So because of this syndrome, there will be loss of glucose, bicarbonate, amino acid, sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphate, uric acid, and the urine. Pretty much everything. The loss of bicarbonate will lead to the type 2 renal tubular acidosis. And that's why type 2 renal tubular acidosis is called proximal renal tubular acidosis. The causes of Fanconi syndrome are very, very high yield for the boards. As we mentioned, Fanconi syndrome can be either inherited or acquired. The most common inherited cause of Fanconi syndrome is called cystinosis. This is a lysosomal storage disease. And please don't confuse cystinosis with cystinuria. Cystinosis does not equal cystinuria. We're going to talk about cystinuria later in the video. So cystinosis is a lysosomal storage disease that causes abnormal accumulation of amino acid called cysteine within the lysosomes of the cells throughout the body. So all the body is affected by this disorder. And one of the parts of the body is the proximal convoluted tubule cells. And this will lead to the dysfunction. Other causes of inherited Fanconi syndrome includes glycogen storage diseases and hereditary fructose intolerance. The common thing about all these disorders is the, just the abnormal accumulation of substances within the cells, and this will lead to the cellular dysfunction. Acquired causes of Fanconi syndrome are even more important and more high yield. The first is the ingestion of old expired tetracyclines. And this is because old tetracyclines becomes converted into toxic substances that damages the proximal convoluted tubule cells. Some antiretroviral agents like tenofovir and didanosine can damage the proximal convoluted tubule cells and lead to Fanconi anemia. And most especially when these two become combined together. Multiple myeloma is also a cause of Fanconi syndrome as well as lead poisoning. The loss of sodium and glucose in the urine will lead to polyuria and polydipsia. Glycosuria means loss of glucose in the urine or the appearance of glucose in the urine. Hypophosphatemia, which means loss of phosphate in the urine. And osteomalacia, this is because of the malabsorption of phosphate. Hypokalemia, because of the malabsorption of potassium.
metabolic acidosis because of the malabsorption of bicarbonate, amino aciduria because of the loss of amino acids in the urine, hyperuricosuria, which means high levels of uric acid in the urine, and finally, all of these things will lead to growth failure in children. Next is renal tubular acidosis type 2. This can be an isolated disorder or can be part of a more generalized disorder affecting the proximal convoluted tubule like Fanconi syndrome. This is caused by the failure of reabsorption of bicarbonate. And remember, 90% of the bicarbonate is reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. This will result in mild metabolic acidosis. And why is it mild? Because the loss of salt and water will result in hypovolemia and the hypovolemia will stimulate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So there will be secondary hyperaldosteronism, or high state of aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone is a hormone that works on the distal nephron to stimulate the salt and water reabsorption, in addition to bicarbonate. In addition to that, there will be increased secretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. The increased secretion of potassium will result in hypokalemia. The compensatory loss of hydrogen ions in the urine will result in a urinary pH that's less than 5.5. This is in contrast to renal tubular acidosis type 1, which is a defect in the distal segment where the urinary pH is more than 5.5. Because if, if the defect is more distal, there will be no time or space for compensation. So this is a very important point. The urinary pH in renal tubular acidosis type 2 is less than 5.5 and it's more than 5.5 in type 1. Another important point is that the mild metabolic acidosis that happens with renal tubular acidosis type 2 is non-anion gap with hyperchloremia. What that means? Basically, because of the loss of bicarbonate in the urine, chloride ions will move from the inside of the cell to the outside in compensation for the lost bicarbonate. And as we know, the formula for calculating the anion gap is basically the sodium minus the sum of the bicarbonate and chloride. So if the bicarbonate goes less and the chloride goes up, still the anion gap will be the same number. And that's why in metabolic acidosis, because of renal tubular acidosis type 2, it's non-anion gap or normal anion gap with hyperchloremia. Next is something called cystinuria. First, there is something called Dye basic amino acids. This includes cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. You can memorize them with the mnemonic COLA that stands for cysteine, ornithine, lysine, and arginine. These dye basic amino acids share a common transporter in both the G genome and the proximal convoluted tubules. So when this transporter is deficient, this will lead to the deficiency of these amino acids. The high urinary concentrations of cysteine, or what's called cystinuria, will result in its precipitation and the formation of kidney stones. And remember again, there is a big difference between cystinuria and cystinosis. Remember, cystinosis was a lysosomal storage disease that can result in the development of Fanconi syndrome, which is the generalized loss of the proximal convoluted tubule function. Cystinuria is just a defect in the transport of dibasic amino acids. So this will lead to the loss of these dibasic amino acids in urine and also in the intestine. And cystinuria, which is the high urinary concentrations of cysteine in the urine, will result in the precipitation and the formation of kidney stones. Next is acute tubular necrosis. This is a damage and necrosis to the proximal convoluted tubule cells. This damage can be caused by ischemia or low blood flow to the kidney or nephrotoxins or toxins that can damage the proximal convoluted tubule cells. Some of these toxins include free hemoglobin or myoglobin. The free hemoglobin is caused by the damage to the red blood cells, the release of hemoglobin into the circulation and its precipitation in the kidney and urine. In the same way, myoglobin is released from the damaged skeletal muscle cells, becomes released into the circulation, and gets precipitated in the kidney. Some medications like aminoglycosides, statins, and cisplatins can also cause it. And finally, some toxins like ethylene glycol can precipitate in the kidney and cause acute tubular necrosis. 
Now I'm going to briefly go through the classes of diuretics that works on the proximal convoluted tubules. The first class is called carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. An example is acetazolamide. These are weak diuretics because they work very early in the nephron. So the nephron has the chance to compensate for the loss of water and sodium by the distal nephron. That's why they have a weak effect. These diuretics works by blocking the bicarbonate and sodium reabsorption. If you remember this image from the previous video, we've discussed the carbonic anhydrase effect in the reabsorption of sodium and bicarbonate. So in the tubular lumen, the hydrogen ions combine with bicarbonate and through carbonic anhydrase becomes converted into carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid dissolves into water and carbon dioxide which readily dissolve into the brush border cells and becomes converted again by carbonic anhydrase into hydrogen ions which becomes re-secreted back into the lumen and bicarbonate which is reabsorbed with sodium through the sodium bicarbonate symporter or co-transporter. So by inhibiting the carbonic anhydrase, we are blocking all this effect. So we will be losing sodium in the urine as well as bicarbonate. But as I said, since this is very early in the segment of the nephron, the distal segment of the nephron still has the chance to compensate for the reabsorption of sodium and bicarbonate. And that's why the effect is a weak effect. This mechanism of action is similar to the pathophysiology of renal tubular acidosis type 2. And if you remember, we said renal tubular acidosis type 2 causes non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And why it's non-anion gap? because the loss of bicarbonate in the urine will be compensated by the movement of chloride ions from the intracellular compartment into the extracellular compartment to maintain the electrical neutrality. And the way we measure the anion gap, it's the difference between the sodium ions and the sum of bicarbonate and chloride. So when the bicarbonate goes down and the chloride ions compensate by going up, the equation will still be the same. So the anion gap will be non-anion gap or normal anion gap because nothing changes. On a side note, topiramate is an anti-epileptic medication that also inhibits the carbonic anhydrase enzyme so it will cause the same exact effect. Finally, the second class of diuretics are called osmotic diuretics. The most famous example is mannitol. These act on the proximal convoluted tubules and the thin descending limb of the lobofelli because these two segments are permeable to water. They increase the urinary flow, so they decrease the contact time between the tubular epithelium and the filtrate. And that's the diuretic effect. Actually, the water loss is more pronounced than the sodium loss, and this can lead to hypernatremia. But remember, initially, it can cause hyponatremia. And why is that? Because the water moves from the intracellular compartment into the extracellular compartment, which is the blood, because of the presence of these osmotic diuretics draws the water from the intracellular into the extracellular compartment and this initially can cause dilutional hyponatremia. As we saw, this was a quick overview of the pathology that can affect the proximal convoluted tubule and the most high yield topics that can be asked on the boards. Please don't forget to watch the previous video about the physiology and thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and see you next time.